Um, my talk is going to probably go a little short, so I'll give people five minutes to wander in. So I'll just do like a really long introduction and, and then I'll go into the talk. So my name is Joseph Dixon and uh, that is my Twitter handle. I've been using that Twitter handle since before Twitter and uh, uh, AOL uh, days. So um, that was before people used their real names on Twitter. So I thought I was being really clever. Um, so yeah, uh, graduated high school in the 90s and, and that Joe for Scott handle still lives with me today. My website is joseph-dixon.com. Uh, the dash is important because there's another Joseph Dixon in Canada who had his website hacked and the guy tried to sell his website to me, which was actually kind of amusing. So he was a uh, politician in Canada. He didn't pay for his web hosting. It got cyber squatted. I guess that's technically not hacked. He got cyber squatted and I got a lot of traffic from Canada for a few days, people thinking I was him. Um, and then a couple weeks ago, he contacted me on my Gmail account trying to sell me the account. Uh, not the Canadian politician, but the, uh, the guy that stole it, um, which, was, which was nice. I told him no, and he hasn't emailed me back, which was, was awesome, actually. Um, I'm a web developer at Pitzer College. That's a small liberal arts college in Claremont, California, with about 1,100 students. Uh, so we use WordPress for the entire front end of our website. And I'm also a member of the Inland Empire Meetup Group. What? What? <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, big fan of WordPress. So, uh, let me see. What other random tri trivia trivia about me? Can I stretch this introduction out for a few I more minutes? No. <laughs> oh, I do have a question. I do have an answer for your question earlier. Um, it was automatic that did some Gutenberg Jenga blocks. And I think I saw somebody had them at a word camp late last year. Cool. Yeah, they were Jenga blocks with like uh, with like uh, the different automatic properties like like on them. So now that it's on video, I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> and then, all right. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So this is uh, what I uh, was working on. Um, the Kubrick theme, if uh, you're not familiar with it, was designed in 2004 and uh, became a default theme for WordPress in 2006. It has not received any updates since 2010. And uh, that's why I decided it would be a fantastic um, item to develop a Gutenberg, uh, to prepare for Gutenberg, right? Because I would set it up, I would get all these all these um, error messages, right? I would run it through a debugger and find out that it's running a ton of different um, deprecated functions. This would be a, so it would appear as though my website has not been updated in, in uh, nine years. And so I, I actually fixed those, uh, those features pretty quickly. Surprisingly, the only error that I saw like right up front was the, uh, the sidebar here completely disappeared. Um, after they stopped updating the theme, they changed how sidebars get queued in WordPress websites. So that was really the only fix I had to do. And naturally, there's some other things that you could improve uh, with Kubrick, but this is more of like an experiment in updating it to be Gutenberg compatible. So for context, uh, this is uh, Michael Hillman. I hope I just pronounced his name correctly. And it was the default theme from 1.2 to 2.9. So I'll give you some context as how long it was a default theme. Now we have default themes that basically last one whole year and then they get replaced by another theme with the exception being for 2017 when they didn't release one for 2018. So this was a default theme for, uh, for uh, four years and was eventually succeeded by um, the 2010 theme, which introduced a lot of those new template tags and functions that WordPress had been developing over the previous uh, four years while it was a default theme. And um, I forgot to mention that is the original, that is the developer of the Kubrick theme. Um, like how you're keeping it in the family. Yeah, I, I mean, he, he's bald. It's just a coincidence. I had no idea that we were both bald. <laughs> 
So you might be not asking yourselves, what did the internet look like in 2006 and why is Kubrick super important to WordPress? And so I figured, well, why not just go to the Wayback Machine on archive.org and literally take screenshots of uh, some social media websites, which quite honestly, in 2006, was the competition for WordPress. This is back when it was a blogging software first and people were starting to use it for business. So that's your Facebook login page from 2006. Facebook actually didn't change so much. Yeah, I yeah, know. I mean, the color palette's still the same. I don't know what MySpace looks like today, but if, uh, if you guys are interested, apparently they had a really good article on Fast and the Furious Drifting uh, <laughs> right around June of 2006. So, so you guys could check that out um, for your uh, Fast and the Furious Tok Tokyo Drift. Uh. <laughs> uh, Twitter, this is funny. Um, now, I have a feeling that this is probably a CSS error in uh, the Twitter platform. When I was using Twitter at this time, this is before we had smartphones. The iPhone didn't come out until the following year. So people were using Twitter on the website, but I was actually using it on my phone. You know, you'd sign up for an account, you would tweet a message to, uh, I think it's 40404 is the phone number, and you would send out tweets. And back then it was just me tweeting to the three other people I know in real life at that time, and we were just doing it as group text messages. And um, YouTube in 2006 was, uh, this is way before Google bought them out. Uh, this is back when uh, they were the video blogging service. So if you take a, it's a little blurry here, but if you were to take a closer look at the screen grab, um, you could uh, see that a lot of these things were just people video blogging. Um, I did forget to mention, I think at the beginning of the video that these slides are available at my, uh, at my website. Um, they're in the footer. So if you guys wanted to follow along on your laptop, you can. So the Kubrick th theme by contrast was easy to use, had a clean design, was sim uh, very simple and extremely modern. Um, back around this time, I worked at a newspaper, right? And I was a web developer back then as well. The idea was always get everything above the fold. Well, I could tell you right now, my editor would freak out if they saw how big that header banner was in, in 2006. Um, because that was the idea. People had computer monitors that were 1024 by 768. So, you know, you'd probably see the first third of this page. But if you're using it for browsing and reading, then it's, it was very clean and easy to read. Um, it's impossible to read now at 13 pixel font size. But back then, it, it looked a lot larger. So getting to the meat of this presentation, the idea was to um, analyze what Kubrick looked like. I updated it a bit. You can see a little mistake there on my search box. This is actually a theme that I had uh, forked. And I started to uh, get it to work. And um, you'll notice I'm running it on a local host that's using a WTP, WP Debug. Um, that will show up alerts and messages if there's something wrong with the code. So it's pretty clean. Uh, the search box is the only thing broken that I noticed. And this is the, uh, the inside page. So, so Kubrick was really simple. It had a front page and it had um, interior pages. And, uh, you know, naturally you're going to say to yourself, well, why would I want to update such an old website for Gutenberg? And that is a legitimate question. Because you have to ask yourself, I'm going to spend 20, maybe 30 hours coding the, the inside of the dashboard to look like the front end of the website on an old, old theme. So ask yourself, would it even be beneficial to yourself or your client to, to use it in the first place? One of the items that, that um, I'll notice is like, well, blocks are super easy to deploy, right? So if you needed to create a button with some text on it, you could do that in like a matter of a couple seconds. Whereas if you did it in the classic editor, you'd have to go do some, um, some class tag hackery, maybe even a short code. Um, and then again, ask yourself, well, should I just be redesigning the website? I mean, you know, if we're gonna be using Gutenberg, maybe we should just like reanalyze whether or not this website has any other problems that need to be addressed. Um, so it's a good time to think, okay, well maybe I'll redesign it af during the uh, use Gutenberg in the redesign process. Um, 
On, additionally, this is what I've found in personal practice. If you switch somebody from Classic Editor Gutenberg, you also have to adopt their, their training, right? I work at a college. Some of my coworkers and colleagues have been using it for three or four years. And as soon as you change that dashboard, they're going to be like, this looks nothing like what I was using yesterday. And they call you on the phone. They send you an email. Um, and it's, it's, I still find myself like referencing documents on how to do something. Or I'll discover some hidden feature in Gutenberg um, that I didn't know about. Gutenberg has a way of hiding things under contextual menus that are literally hidden. You hover over something, and then suddenly a little plus icon shows up. And that is just really frustrating. But it is clean. So once you get used to it, it it's good to use. So um, chances are you've at least installed Gutenberg for a few minutes. So this will look familiar to you. This is the default styles that if your uh, theme does not support Gutenberg, you'll end up with this large serif font uh, header followed by uh, a paragraph of text, a quote, uh, quote block. All these things are the default blocks you would find in the editor. But what if, what if it looked like uh, the theme itself? And th this is actually key. Um, I found that when I started editing uh, my themes for the back end to look more like the front end, it actually saved uh, the clients, being my coworkers and colleagues, a little bit of time. If they floated an image to the left or to the right, then it would look something like this on the front end. So sometimes people get concerned about the line break of a word showing up right next to an image in a particular spot, and they'll edit the text to get it to land there. It's just little things like that. So if you can customize the back end of the website to look like the front end, you can save some time for the people developing the software. Um, Jason, yesterday morning, was presenting on Elementor and block editors in general. And block, uh, block page builders. Page builders. And what he was saying was effectively what I hear from everyone else who doesn't want to develop is like, I just want to know what the website's going to look like before I hit publish. And this is kind of a gray area in between that can allow you to do a little bit of that without having to install a page builder. So uh, during the rest of this talk, I'll be showing you how you can go in and uh, override some of your design changes to uh, do something like this. Uh, the first part is learning how to enqueue uh, block styles. The, uh, the top one is the one that we'll be covering today because this is a classic theme that was designed before, um, before, the, before Gutenberg. But there are two other uh, functions. Um, you can have the style show up on the front end of the website and on the back end, or even just on the front end of the website. Those will be used for different reasons. So let's say you're building a theme today from scratch, you'd probably want to use the second option uh, in queue block assets. Because then that way you're only setting up your design styles once and it goes in both places. Uh, the last one, let's say you're designing a website today and um, you know that you're going to be using Classic Editor for a while. Then, then you could just uh, throw them over to the front end and, and not worry about what it looks like on the, the block editor. It's, it's kind of a backwards way of thinking because if you installed Gutenberg, it wouldn't work um, on, the, on the back end. But there's reasons for that. So we're going to be talking about just styling the editor for the rest of this talk. And that is uh, in queue block editor assets. So um, I'll have that. Uh, the slides are on my website if you guys want to inspect it later. Um, this is what an entire co code block would look like in functions.php if you wanted to enqueue the block editor styles. So starting at the top, we, we build the function, we, uh, we enqueue the style sheet. I'm giving it a name of Gutenberg Editor CSS. That way, if I look at the uh, source code later on, I'll know that this is pulling in the Gutenberg Editor CSS. Um, I should not be seeing this on the front end of the website, but I should be seeing it if I do an inspection on, on, the, on the editor. Uh, if I'm seeing it in both places, then I probably enqueued, enqueued it with the wrong, uh, with the wrong uh, assets there on the right. And then, of course, the path where the, uh, the CSS file is located. So um, because there is, I lost count of how many core blocks there are on Gutenberg, and they're adding a few new ones every couple months, I'm only going to be covering four. No one's got time to go over every single video embed block from the 12 different uh, 
video services that they have included. So the first one is uh, clockwise from top, uh, top uh, around would be um, the title block, the paragraph block, um, the quote block on the right, and the list block on the left. All of these have unique styles for Kubrick, so um, they also tend to be the most used uh, when you're developing a informational website. So that's really low resolution, guys. I'm so sorry. The the uh, what is happening here is I, I inspect the um, the editor while I'm working on it to try to see what CSS classes I'm going to need to override in order to get the uh, the title to look the way I want it to. So on the left, you have the uh, the the class tags that I ended up overriding for my theme that allow me to change the font and the size and all the other information. So in this case, uh, you'll see some similarities as I flip through the rest of the slide presentation. Uh, the reference to the word editor, the reference to uh, what it does, and then underscore, underscore something else. And I, it's, it's, I, it's a repeated method so that developers know what they're editing. Um, I don't know if it mentions it in the handbook just yet, but, but I've been noticing a pattern, so I might as well work with it. Um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention. So what I'm doing here is setting the uh, font fam family to Liberation Sans, which is kind of like Arial and, and Helvetica. And then um, fallback is uh, a sans serif font and adjusting the line height. Um, the reason I'm doing that is I want to get rid of some of that additional padding. Um, on the titles because the default Gutenberg styles are this really big title and uh, Kubrick was was tiny so um, also edit overwriting the editor width something I've noticed uh, in the other direction is that um, the blocks are very narrow in in Gutenberg and the front end of the themes tend to be very wide in this case it's actually the opposite so I needed to uh, change the max width to 480 pixels so I could squeeze it a little bit um, but you can go in the other direction um, WP block is more of a general class tag that applies to all the blocks and so you know I set the font family and the sans serif and uh, the line height and all this stuff that I would like to see flow further on into the process some of it doesn't really work, and I'll go on to that in, in a later slide. It's because um, there's a lot of inline CSS in Gutenberg right now, and I'm hoping that it gets addressed later on. But by simply uh, inspecting and, and grabbing the paragraph block, and that's all I'm really doing is saying, okay, if it's a paragraph and it's in the editor styles wrapper, then set the font size to 13 pixels and the line height to 1.4. Really simple, right? I don't want it to be 18 pixels and, and super spaced out. That's not what my theme is looking for. Unfortunately, I had to use important tags because the way that the JavaScript works in Gutenberg, when you focus on uh, a block, when you start editing the block, JavaScript and class tags start showing up. It's very responsive to your, whether or not you're inputting with that particular block or not. And that affects uh, some of your styles. So in practice, what, what I found myself happening while I was editing this particular block is I'd be like, ah, oh, great, it looks great. It's 13 pixels, the line height is perfect, looks just like the front end. Then I would click on it to edit the text and the line height would increase. And then I would unclick it and it would squeeze back down. Sometimes it wouldn't even squeeze back down. So the last thing you want is bouncing text in your editor. <laughs> so important tags. Um, fortunately, no, unfortunately, the list block is really busy. Uh, same method. The list block, you, you actually have two default blocks, a large, uh, no, sorry, ordered list and unordered list. So there's a lot of code to go with that. Um, same idea. Identifying which class tags are in the editor and then overwriting them. So you see a lot of repeated references. The line height for 1.3, for whatever reason, uh, this, this theme wanted to make the list a, a little bit smaller line height. They didn't repeat the exact same line height in the design, but I still had to run an important tag through it because of some CSS issues. Um, the next one is the font size, 
and the, the padding uh, above and below the list elements to try to squeeze them up a little bit. And um, the, uh, the padding left of the, uh, the standard block. Um, in this theme, if you're doing a, uh, an unordered list, it will pad it over to the right, make it look more, uh, it's, it's not in the same alignment as the paragraph block. But the ordered lists were. Six months is watching this video and laughing right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Sounds great. Um, so the remainder of this code is just styling the, uh, the, the back end of the editor to look like the front end. So a lot of what I was working on at this point was referencing the original style sheet and code from the original developer and trying to apply it to the back end and, and, and doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of code because none of his code will show up in uh, the block editor. I liked this one because it only had four lines. <laughs> and it still had its own weirdness. Um, it, the quote block has two options in Gutenberg. You have the uh, large quote, and I'm guessing the is not large. So if you take a, a closer look at that top line right there, there is a pseudo class in that class tag. What that is trying to do is saying, okay, if this is not the large block, then apply these styles. Well, one of the problems I ran into that isn't sort of directly related to this project is if you're adding additional uh, quote blocks to the core blocks, because you could extend core blocks in Gutenberg, which makes it really great if you have a block that does 90% of what you want to do and you want to adjust it. So you create a third version, right? No big deal. Well, then these styles would apply to that one too, unless of course it was labeled is uh, style large in the class tag. So that, that had its own little issues. Um, I know that's a bit of an aside, but if you ever get into it, it, it made things a little tricky. Uh, no doubt there's a lot of trial and error in overwriting uh, the uh, Gutenberg styles and a lot of inline CSS that required me to go in and um, use the important tag. I found it kind of frustrating because <laughs> I, 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 I kind of pride myself in not using the important tag. I've been doing CSS long enough that I know if I have to use it, it's not because of me. <laughs> so, um, testing the CSS overrides. Uh, on the left, you have my, my block themes. So you'll see some uh, commonalities there with the underscores, the post title. It gives you an idea of where the CSS is going. There's references to wrappers for the, the paragraph block. But, you know, this tells you that the code that I'm writing is just going to be for the post editor itself. And this is the uh, style from um, the original theme itself. And uh, actually the end of the style sheet, which is a surprising 731 lines of uh, uh, CSS. This, this guy was really lean with his work. And a reference to uh, a quote at the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, where uh, HAL 9000 is singing Daisy Daisy as he's getting shut down, which is why the theme was nicknamed Kubrick. If you look for it in a, in a theme archive, it'll just say default theme. But people in the community refer to it as the Kubrick theme, and it's because of that little line of code. Good yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this is a before and after of, of the, uh, the editor where the, the fonts were the default styles and then what I was able to work on in, in a couple hours of CSS work to make the, the front end and the back end look more alike. And more importantly, this is what I was going for, making it so that if somebody is editing on the back end, they know what it will look like before they hit publish or schedule. Because if we're working on a website, especially what I do with in, in higher education, is I'll want to post a press release and I'll kind of want to know what it will look like before I schedule it for three weeks out. And this is kind of like that. Sure, you could use the preview button, but this will save you literally seconds every single time you would have maybe hit that preview button. And that doesn't sound like that big of a deal, 
but if you've seen how low that these, how slow that some uh, page uh, page uh, builders, builders yeah. will edit with, I mean, come on, they have a loading sequence. <laughs> you know, this this will save you a little bit of time, and this is all stuff that you could do in core without installing additional plugins. It just means that you're going to have to. To, uh, edit some CSS, create your own CSS, and drop it into your child theme or or uh, or your original theme. So, oh, I upload. You guys missed the animation on this because I uploaded it to Google Slides and it's no longer animated. No. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you guys have all seen 2001: A Space Odyssey, so I'll just tell you it's just him asking how to open the pod bay doors in a loop for like two seconds. Which is kind of what it's like working with Gutenberg, right? <laughs> You're like, all I want to do is get to this button to go right here. Just right there. Just right there. Why is it not that way? So, yeah, yeah, no kidding. So quite frankly, uh, possible next, next steps you guys might be interested in is, you know, go in and queue the block, the block editor. Start with the WP dash block and see what kind of styles that you can adjust for you yourself or your client's website that will just uh, uh, adjust the width or whatever and start playing with it. Um, you could visit the Gutenberg handbook. It, the documentation is really getting good. It's written in such a way where you kind of have to start on the first page and flip through it like an actual novel, which is a little strange because I like to go through stuff like Stack Overflow style and just find the solution like at the bottom of the screen that everyone upvoted. Yeah, no, the handbook is not written that way. So, <laughs> so it's best to just read it left to right, up to down. Um, and heck, why not? Watch 2001 A Space Odyssey while coding or your other favorite movie and then just throw a little quote at the bottom of it just to see if anyone references it, you know, a couple years later. Um, Part of the reason I wanted to give this talk is, as an example, I hear this a lot uh, from, from meetups and friends who also use WordPress, is that they're scared of Gutenberg. And, and yeah, it's, it, it will have a time commitment to learn how to edit and work with it, but the payoff is down the road. Once, once you get a few things under your belt, um, it's actually really responsive and quick to use. I started using Gutenberg in ways that I didn't think I would. I, I've used Evernote as a notebook. I've used uh, other different type of apps. Now I could just use my WordPress dashboard and you know, I, there's like little tricks in Gutenberg. Like you can like hit return and it creates a new block, right? But did any of you guys know that you could just hit slash and start typing and you could search for the blocks? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I really should have put that in the slideshow because that's probably the one largest thing that you guys are going to like want to check out later. So create a block, hit the slash right next to your shift key and start typing. And, and so if you're looking for image block, it'll just pop up right there. So what you could do is just start tabbing through and they've made so many accessibility improvements to Gutenberg that the workflow of typing and writing in Gutenberg is so streamlined that I don't even bother using um, uh, LibreOffice or Microsoft Word, I just start editing and working in the in the editor. I mean, I'm writing for myself, right? So I'm not going to have to share it with a uh, um, uh, another editor. <laughs> so that that's all on the presentation, and I did finish a little early, about 15, 20 minutes early. I'm hoping you guys have some questions. Question time. Yeah, question time. Let's go to let's go into questions. No, I, I was getting a little bit lost earlier. Are those all in function PHP? Like, like to 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 work on the width? Is that all in functions .php? Or like those blocks or, or these here? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is my uh, my blocks.css file. Oh, that's your own. Yeah. 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 So what you uh, um, it probably didn't pick up your question. He was asking if uh, this code here was in uh, PHP. It's actually in CSS. Man, it would have been so much nicer if I put CSS at the beginning of this slide. Thank you for referencing well, no, that. You, you would, yeah. yeah. If you know CSS, then yeah, but um, just trying to figure out what No, I, I probably, no. This is the only part that was PHP in the presentation. And, and you're right. I didn't have a PHP tag at the beginning and the end of this to provide a hint. So it looks very similar. 
Um, so this is the only PHP you would have to do is add something like this to your functions tag to reference a style sheet. So I came in a minute late. But sure. Is, is this now in the repository and I can go install Kubrick right now today because you've remade it? No. <laughs> no. Um, or is it at least in GitHub so we can download I, it? I do. I actually, okay, thank you for that. I, I, I have the code on GitHub if you want to download it. I ask that you do not use it on a production website, <laughs> that you do it in a safe space that's not going to eat any content because all I did was edit those three or four blocks and everything else on that is not Gutenberg ready. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you want to see the code in the blocks, I'm going to be adding the code to my post on my website, but also the, uh, you, could, you could follow it on, um, on GitHub if you wanted to check it out. I might actually go back there and make a few small edits over time. Um, the problem with uh, Gutenberg isn't Gutenberg's fault. It's just not responsive and people don't look at 13 pixel fonts on, um, on uh, their, their desktop 4K screens. So if you, if, you, if you guys thought that this is very hard to read, it's hard to read for a reason. It's because we don't, we don't consume websites the same way today. And um, I, I still know a few mathematicians who actually use the old school thing. Oh, okay. I want to give them a, an upgrade path. <laughs> okay, well you might want to you might want to fork the uh, the project. You're free to do so over there on GitHub and then <laughs> fix all the errors that I haven't addressed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I just want to point out that um, uh, there is on the theme repository a responsive version of Kubrick. There uh, is. There. Um, I don't remember the developer's name, but his talk is on WordPress.tv. And his talk was from, I want to say 2014, where he literally went through, did the same thing I did, so it would work with WordPress, but before Gutenberg, and he audited, uh, audited the code. And so, for instance, he turned this background image into an actual CSS background and rounded the edges, and it works on phones. Um, I didn't do that, but you know what? I might, I might fork his project, too, and save myself some time, and then, you know, I can call this uh, Kubrick 3.0 or something, or 5.0, and make no money off of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, Kubrick, Kubrick uh, 2010. 2010? Yeah. I could do that, but it's still nine years old. <laughs> well, but you at least keep the movie. Oh, oh, I got you, 2010. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that wasn't that wasn't filmed by Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, question? So, I guess, uh, would you say, I, I, my question would be, what would you say you really pulled out of this project while you were working on it? Okay, that's a really good question because this was the first thing that I had done in Gutenberg. And it's kind of like, you, you, mo most of you are designers. You, in, you might inherit a website from somebody that has not been redesigned in five years. And they hand you a theme and, and they say to you, I really love this website, uh, can you make it work? And this is kind of that process, right? You don't have to throw out the old code. You can go in, you can refactor it, you can audit it, and you can customize it for, for Gutenberg so that it's modern again. Um, that was really, really what I was trying to get through. It also taught me um, that I don't have to go in and add additional blocks from plugins, I could just go into my theme and add adjustments, and then that website will literally just have the theme and, and core WordPress, and that just means I have to hit update less frequently, which saves me time on uh, maintaining a website. Uh, any other questions? In the back? I think a general issue with Gutenberg on the back end right now is that not just for this site, but for any, any site, the back end is not adopt the styling of the front end. I understand. I think that that someone said that that capability is supposed to be coming to Gutenberg at some point. Well, it's been four months. <laughs> Gutenberg was released in December, and it's still not here. And and yes, it is in a way. And on the function slide, that's kind of what's going on here. Is that let's if you plan out your CSS correctly, well. 
if you plan out your CSS, saying correct would be inaccurate because any way you use it is your way of using it. Um, if you plan it out, you could say, okay, well, I know these blocks are going to be on my website. I'm, I'm going to literally write a style sheet that applies to every single Gutenberg block. And so you can enqueue your blocks on the back end and the front end. And then anything else that isn't related to your blocks, you could place in another style sheet. Or you could place them in the same style sheet if they don't conflict with each other. Because at the end of the day, your back end is still going to be the back end. And you don't want all those extra styles um, interfering with your admin bar or doing some other weirdness. So, so you could do them in both places. And I think that uh, what you said about the, uh, the front end and the back end looking the same, I think that what they're referring to is the third one where, no, the second one where you're doing it on the front end and the back end. Any, any other questions? Okay. Uh, we are super early. So uh, I guess that's it. You want me to put on the wig? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the MacGyver wig. Let's see. MacGyver yeah. wig. Yeah. I got to touch the MacGyver wig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so David was uh, hacking Gutenberg for, uh, what was it? No. What was the name of your talk earlier today? Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. <laughs> MacGyver plays with Yeah. <laughs> yes. MacGyver plays with box. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, like, uh, you certainly did MacGyver uh, Kubrick. Yeah. Uh, I. Into working with Gutenberg. Yeah, but I really did feel like I was MacGyvering. Uh, I really did feel like I was MacGyvering uh, Gutenberg in the sense that, uh, as you could see when I was going through some of the slides, some of the CSS I had to apply in some places didn't work in others. So I had to literally go through and fiddle like crazy. I spent more time working on that CSS than I did at the slide presentation for. Uh, for this, so um, I think that shows. <laughs> and everybody coming to work at Riverside is going to have to wear a wig. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so awesome. Uh, Shaver had to wear a wig. No, I just. Hey, you have one wig in there. No, I have not. Nah. Pass that thing oh, over here. Don't have any, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any wig. Yeah. <laughs> no. Don't do it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I think uh, you know, what it feels like with Gutenberg is Gutenberg has a bunch of features that he wants to implement. Yes. But it's waiting for uh, certain web technologies to catch up to make it feasible to implement. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Gutenberg has a lot of features that are not implemented and, and, and a lot of blocks that I, I think that are missing from core blocks. Right. When I made that joke about having uh, a video embed, if you go through and look at every single core block there is, at last count it's about 40. About half of those are video embeds for different platforms. I would really, really like them to spend the time on having a list thing where you could put a little checkbox and you could check things off and like make a checklist rather than um, rather it's than an unstop. Yeah. It, so I mean, there's a reason right there. Anyone listening uh, today, you can create a block and uh, and make billions of internet dollars just for having a checkbox on it. So people could check stuff off. Fun times. Wait, wait, what is that? A checklist? <laughs> like a checklist block. I mean, come, I, like, like, no, seriously. That, How many times have you gone in and, and went into your email and, no, not email, but um, Google, uh, Google, what's the Google list? Keep. Google, Google yeah. Keep has a block that you could check off, right? Yeah. Well, we could be able to do that in yeah, WordPress. You create that already? <laughs> yeah, so. That was basic app, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Good job.